Welcome back to panel discussion two. Thanks for coming back into the uh, the room here and hope you all made it in okay. And uh, if any of your colleagues are struggling to get into the room, remember there is always the, uh, the help button available. Uh, we're ready to take your call, as they say. Uh, this discussion is, of course, about cultural burning and the sacredness and increasing recognition of the sacredness of water. Uh, really interesting chat building on uh, our first discussion, of course, um, around caring for country. But here we'll be hearing about how cultural knowledge has embedded into um, the solutions that are um, embedded in different um, government departments uh, today and, uh, and how it's helping to reset the relationship between government and uh, Indigenous communities. Um, of course, building partnerships requires thinking about the long term, as we heard uh, just a moment ago, the importance of permanent uh, partnerships and permanent relationships and accountability measures, of course, need to reflect this. So in this session, we'll be looking at different ways of thinking about accountability and delivering on commitments and how partnerships can improve accountability in the long term. I'll bring in our first panelist now. He's Shane Graham, and he's joining us from New Zealand. He's the CEO of the uh, Taranga Ngati Rarua, uh, organization and I'm sure Shane will do a much better version of uh, of that than, than than I could ever do. He is of course uh, uh, a Maori man and has broad governance and strategic experience across a range of sectors at national and, uh, and local levels and his experience has led to a number of uh, significant leadership and advisory roles in government and across the community community sector. Shane, thank you for joining us. Kia ora. Kia ora, Dan. Nice to be here. Firstly, to get our conversation started before I bring in our, our second panelist, what what are your what are your thoughts on the the broad topic um, around cultural burning, um, as well as the sacredness of, of of water, and how are you seeing that in in your work and in the, the New Zealand context? Hmm. Um, Tua tahi, e mehi tēnei ki a koutou, uh, te papaka nui a Māori, uh, ki a matua Dave Wandon, uh, una kōrero, uh, i te uh, i whakatau pai ai mātou, uh, tēnei, uh, o tēnei hui, uh, e mehi atu ki ai, uh, o tira ki a koe Dan, nau te whakahairi, uh, o tēnei uh, mai au te aroa, te taui o te waka tēnei, o nati raukau a te iwi, o nati kore ki kahu kura te hapa. Uh, so before I answer your question, I just want to acknowledge the, uh, the opportunity to come here and also the words of uh, Komatua, uh, Dave and yourself and uh, so forth. So um, in terms, that's a broad question from our point of view here in Aotearoa. We're going through major thinking and changes relating to uh, water, to wai tapu, wai Māori, fresh water especially. Uh, we see a range of... Um, initiatives that the government uh, are pushing through at the moment with the mana o te wai, the authority of water. Um, and we also see it through the three waters reforms that are coming through relating to uh, waste, sewage and non-fresh water. So it's, uh, it's an all encompassing discussion which probably won't be covered here today, but this, as we uh, allude to in terms of from our point of view, from Te Ao Māori point of view for here, for us here, um, e tapu te wai. Um, Water is sacred uh, for some of us. Uh, we are water and water is us. So from uh, our uh, first principles, if you like, uh, we have an obligation to that water as kaitiaki, as stewards. Um, and the discussion around ownership is something that's going to be the next battleground, if you like, in terms of authority and um, mana motuhaki for us as iwi across uh, the top of the South Island, who we, uh, we, where I'm from and I represent right through to all the other tribes in Aotearoa. Thank you, and thank you for those uh, introductory remarks. I now bring in our second panel. 
analyst, Scott Falconer, he's the director uh, of forest and fires with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria. He's the Deputy Chief Fire Officer and uh, Director of Forest and Fire Operations there. He's spent almost 30 years working in natural resource management in fisheries, wildlife, land and fire management. And he's leading the department's efforts to support and enable traditional owners to reintroduce cultural burning practices on country. Scott, thanks for making time for this discussion today. Let's start by, yeah, the, the work are you doing to reintroduce those cultural burning practices? Can you uh, give us a flavour of the work that you're undertaking there? Uh, sure, Dan, and thank you for having me. I'd just like to acknowledge that I, I'm currently on Jara country in Jaja Rung uh, lands in central Victoria and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, look, this has been a four or five year journey for us, and I'm speaking not on behalf of Aboriginal people, I'm not an Aboriginal person, but we've worked really, really closely in, I think um, your opening remarks, you talked about partnerships and accountability, and I think that's where it started, where we've had conversations about recognised Aboriginal rights here to, particularly with the Jaja Rung in the area that I've been managing, um, around wanting to manage country, and then the conversations around um, Xia Xiaorang people wanting to return cultural fire to country. Um, and that has been, a, a you know, it started with a coffee chat and um, I've written a Churchill Fellowship 60 page paper on this, so that's available to anyone. Um, and some of the lessons, they're, they're extremely simple on one level, but really profound on another. And they're around building meaningful relationships um, and the trust that comes from that at an organisational level, but I think very profoundly at an individual level. Um, that commitment that agency staff have to have to develop those relationships. This is nothing new to Aboriginal people. Um, and also recognising the le legal rights and connection to Aboriginal people formally to give access to their country. Um, that's the really short version. We've gone from no burning in Victoria on public land in partnership with Aboriginal people to the best of our knowledge for 170 years to doing the first um, burns uh, four years ago. Um, we've now completed in partnership with a variety of different traditional owner groups about 30 burns and, and I'm excited to advise that we now have 120 burns planned with six different traditional owner groups across Victoria. That's really great news and, and look forward to yeah chatting more about how you've built those partnerships and grown them in, in what seems uh, relatively speaking, a, a really short space of time. Let's bring in now our third panellist, Dr Erin O'Donnell. She's a water law and policy specialist. Uh, she focuses on water markets, environmental flows and water governance. And she's worked in water resource management since 2002 in both the private and public sectors. She's recognised internationally for her research into the groundbreaking field of legal rights for rivers and the challenges and opportunities these new rights create for protecting the social, cultural and natural values of rivers. A few years ago now, she was appointed to the inaugural Birrarung Council, the voice of the Yarra River. And for the past two and a half years, she's been working in partnership with the uh, Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations Group on a project to identify law and policy pathways to increase Aboriginal access to water rights in Victoria. Erin, thank you for being part of this discussion. Let's yeah, let's focus. Um, let's focus squarely with you on water rights. Where where is the that conversation up to at the moment, and how are how are government doing it, uh, building partnerships focused on water rights with indigenous groups? So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I will also acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I also acknowledge that Wurundjeri, uh, like all First Nations and traditional owners across Australia, have never ceded their rights to lands and waters. And I think that's a really important opening for this conversation because um, certainly in Australia, we are only reluctantly and only very recently really acknowledging um, the dispossession of water um, as well as of land for Aboriginal people. So I think in many ways we are at almost the very beginning um, as, as white fellas, um, I am not an Indigenous person. I think, yeah, white Australia is at the very beginning of this conversation about water and water partnerships. 
Um, having said that, there are some, I think, reasons to, to be optimistic that this is a beginning and that this is a genuine beginning of that recognition um, of the ongoing relationship, cultural protocols and laws of First Nations people when it comes to water. So, yeah, there's, there's been some recent water handbacks, there's been some commitment by government to uh, future water handbacks. Um, there is, yeah, there is some, some genuine changes in the way that, that governments are beginning to approach the idea of, of Aboriginal rights to water, but it still is a very long way to go. So just, just this week, um, a report came out from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that was looking at Aboriginal ownership of water across the Murray-Darling Basin, and it's approximately 0.1%. Um, and so in, in places where um, there is a, a significant population disparity as well, you can start to highlight that injustice purely in a comparative sense. So for the New South Wales portion of the Murray-Darling Basin, for instance, Aboriginal people make up about 10% of the population and they currently own 0.2% of the water rights. And of course, First Nations um, continue to assert that all water is Aboriginal water um, and that, that water is a living being and should be treated accordingly. That's a statement that comes from the Echuca Declaration. So we're starting to see not only a push to recognise um, that Aboriginal people have rights to water, but that the ways in which we should be thinking about water and relating to water and rivers also need to be fundamentally transformed. Where, let's go back across the Tasman. Um, I want to bring you in again on, on this question. From what you've heard uh, in context around uh, cultural burning, but then there from Aaron about water rights, how does that compare to, to uh, where things are at in, in the New Zealand context? Uh, good, again. Uh, I think there's, there's a there's a conversation to be had about what people want to hear and what they need to hear. And I think, to be fair, um, philosophically and the experiences are varied, but they're the same. Uh, we see the degradation of the waterways. We're seeing a, a disastrous uh, decline in the quality of our water uh, in our foreshore and seabed area where our sea fish and our uh, our traditional uh, gathering spaces and places have, are down to zero ability to regenerate and do things. So the catalyst, if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same result. So I think on the same parity as Australia, we're heading towards uh, and trending towards a pretty bad space. So unless we do something, unless we take control, and I'm talking about cultural control of this space and lead through this, this myriad of policy, and legislation which is fuzzing and uh, hampering our ability to have honest communications with our agencies, with our departments, and to hear the stories of regions, I don't think we're going to move the conversation forward. Going down the rabbit hole with um, legislation and lawyers and Queen's Council sitting around tables uh, and discussing what legislatively they can do to help remedy these situations is not going to help in the long term, I believe. It may address some of the uh, the sorry departments and agencies' requirements and fulfil their obligations uh, that they have. But the reality is, from a mana funeral point of view, we're looking to move past that and build real strength in our in our trusting relationships we have with our departments to give effect to what we're doing now. So we've got some pretty big projects that I can have a talk later on. Um, that have allowed us to to take that cultural control um, through a mana enhancing way, um, even though we could um, do it a, in, in a different way, and to sort of say, hey, we're not alone in this. You're not alone in this particular uh, issue. We can let's not look at um, the issue itself, but what are the solutions? How can we do this? And I think that's where we're at in terms of Aotearoa at the moment. Why, you mentioned there, you know, let's not have Queen's councils or, or special councils at, at 10 paces. What, what do you mean um, 
by that is that, that a government has taken an overly um, bureaucratic um, approach when it comes to, to dealing with groups like yours around land and, and sea rights, do, do you think? And, uh, yeah, can you just tease out what uh, yeah, the problem well, in the relational sense there? Yeah. In my role as a chief executive, I have to be pretty pragmatic. And the thing is, it's cheaper to talk than go to court, to be honest. We are littered with... Um, um, lot, we don't have the capacity or the resources to enter into long protracted legal battles with our treaty partner um, that will end up through whatever um, process um, of not getting to an end result which is satisfactory to both parties. We just can't afford it, to be honest, and that's the problem. Yeah, it sounds like you're hoping that a whole a range of processes uh, are tipped on their head and, and changed. Uh, what what are some of the main changes that you're you, you're hoping there? When you said that we're on a, a slippery slope to, to somewhere not very good a minute ago. Well, it wouldn't it wouldn't take much um, to look back over the last decade of the environmental change that's occurring across Aotearoa in the South Island here. We are seeing particularly cultural markers of deterioration and degradation, which show to us we're in trouble. And if we don't come together and do something, um, it's not only going to be bad for us, it's going to be bad for the whole of our, uh, our island here, but also for our future generations. Our legacy to be good ancestors is it going to be held in doubt if we don't get together and nut this out and put in some real practical um, processes and procedures, not only about engagement, but also about outcomes. What is it we can actually do? Sometimes it's easier to eat the elephant bite by bite rather than try and eat it all in one go. And so we've attempted to do that. And we've got some examples of that, which we can talk about uh, later on in our, uh, in our cordial, in our yarning circle. I'll bring you back in now and you, you spoke about how this is um, you know still quite a nascent area and that um, that, that governments are only recently come around to um, you know uh, understand um, if if not uh, embrace water rights for indigenous people what what do you think has led to the shift that we've seen so far um, you know no matter how small the shift that might be so I think we can trace um, some of the origins of this, of the current state of affairs. Um, if we look back at some of the, um, the international declarations from Indigenous people about water, um, specifically in the Australian context, um, the Murray River nations came together in 2007 and 2010 with the Echuca Declaration. Um, and this was a very powerful declaration from those nations about what water is, so recognising water as a living being and the role that it plays um, in ancestor stories and origins and cultural protocols, as well as articulating the idea of a cultural flow being an inherent right for First Nations and traditional owners across Australia. And that this, this right includes water of appropriate quantity and quality um, to meet the social and environmental and economic and cultural needs of Aboriginal people. And so that declaration, I think, has, has really been an important shift in, in thinking, um, certainly in, in awareness um, for white Australia. There, I think the challenge has been um, in the question of, of water allocation and recognising that if we are in an over allocated situation as we are say for most of the Murray Darling Basin there simply isn't any more water to be easily um, allocated you're talking about a situation where you need to find a way to take water off somebody who's currently using it and hand it back to people whose rights were stripped away um, at invasion and at repeated intervals since invasion that have made it very difficult for Aboriginal people to um, to own water and to exercise rights in water management so it's, yeah, there's been a, an, a legacy of leadership and persistence from Aboriginal people, and that's coming together as, yeah, as, as awareness is building and, um, 
as there is this recognition that this is at its heart a justice issue um, and that quite frankly continuing on in this in this way um, is inherently unjust and I think that's that justice framing is really powerfully underscored now by this benchmarking work that has come out of Griffith University and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that really shows how very very little water Aboriginal people have and how they are continually denied their rights to water by the function of the water market, by the way that land and water are no longer um, united in Australian water policy. So even receiving rights to land or native title agreements will not bring the rights to water. So as we've put all those pieces together, um, it's, now pretty, it's now a situation where the role of government, I think, is a lot clearer um, in terms of how to start taking action to address this. What do you say um, to public servants that might work in, in a, a water department or an environment department um, on this call uh, should, should be doing in their day-to-day -day practices to uh, promote those water rights groups? And I suppose distinct from that, that question, what do, do governments, the elected officials and, and the executive uh, need to do as well? I think first and foremost, there needs to be a recognition um, of, in, in the Australian context, but everywhere um, around the world, really, that Indigenous peoples are rights holders, they're not stakeholders. So understanding the role of sovereignty and unceded sovereignty in terms of where Indigenous peoples are being placed in this conversation about water is, is really crucial um, from the get-go. Um, and then that starts to frame the conversation about what it is that you're trying to achieve with water. I think we've historically, um, and I think this is a challenge for governments, have focused on um, participation, on consultation, on um, you know, bringing in this idea of, of Aboriginal engagement, whereas actually what we need to be focused on um, are genuine partnerships, genuine um, power transfers, and genuine shifts in water ownership and water management and that I think fundamentally shift the way that we're even framing a conversation around water. So in the Australian context water law is still very much driven by the, the framing of water as a resource and so it's about how do we allocate this resource, how do we get the maximum value out of this resource whereas we don't stop to think about what role is water playing in our communities, in our religions, in our cultural values. Um, and when you're engaging with Aboriginal people and you're talking to them about what is the role of water in country, um, it's, it's a sacred entity. Um, it has multiple dimensions. It's a being that you can have a relationship with. And recognising rivers in that way, rivers and groundwater aquifers and all water systems, that has the capacity to really start to transform our water laws and water policies um, at a really foundational way. And obviously this, there's still a lot of work to be done and this is early days in terms of where you hope relationships get between government and First Nations groups around water rights. But are, are there any um, genuine partnerships that are already in, in place between uh, First Peoples groups and, and government in this space and, and what are they achieving, Erin? So yeah, that's I think that's a very big question. Um, I look, in, look forward to drilling into some detail in the yarning circle, but there are yeah there are definitely partnerships. There are growing numbers of partnerships, and there are partnerships at different levels of government. Um, so again, in the Australian context, um, it's really important to remember that you're you're dealing with multiple nations, um, and so each nation um, is going to expect the capacity to have a have a partnership agreement, nation to government. Um, so peak bodies can play a really important role in facilitating some of those partnerships, but there's, yeah, it's taken, I think, white Australia a bit of a while to learn um, to think about nations as the, the important partnership relationship and see some of the peak bodies as ways of, of getting to that um, rather than focusing on that relationship with a peak body. But there is, there is real opportunity. There has been some significant shifts um, just recently. So at the end of last year, Victoria saw the very first ever um, 
state commitment to a significant volume of water hand back to traditional owners, um, which happen in southeast Victoria. So we're starting to see that there's more of those opportunities which will be on the cards this year. And, and those opportunities have come about because of um, ongoing relationships and partnerships between the state government and the specific nations, as well as um, the work that, that I've been doing with, uh, with Mildren and with other traditional owners across the state to facilitate some of those relationships. So yeah, there's, there's definitely some exciting um, examples that are now starting to come through. Across the Tasman to Shane, same question for you, Shane. Can you, can you give us an example of uh, a, a genuine partnership, a proud partnership, a high-functioning partnership in, um, in, the, in the space that you're working in when it comes to the, uh, the sacredness of, of land and, and water and uh, what, what is that partnership achieving? So the intergenerational strategy, um, which has been uh, a a process of coming together with a view line of the next 50 to 100 years of the future of our region and its environment, not only um, in isolation, but along with its economy, along with uh, uh, all the other um, tenants in terms of, of laying out really a combined and collaborative approach to seeing this region develop, not only as a great region, but doing it good as well. And good in terms of meaning that we're in partnership and collaboratively working together. So that's been signed up by all eight iwi here. Um, those are the tribes from the top of the South Island, who I will note are the biggest landowners, the biggest tax contributors, and the biggest ratepayers. Alongside that, their corporations, their business arms, who are some of the biggest in the, in the region as well, have signed up to that. But what's more importantly from the point of view of maybe the listeners here today is all the government departments and the mayors and the local councils have signed up to this future strategy. And some say, well, uh, when is this strategy going to begin and when does it, it's already begun? We're already underway in, in doing various landscape works um, with other projects. We've uh, had numerous emergencies that everyone experiences. And it's funny, you should say, because it's not, it's only often when things are at their very best, when people come together to find a way forward. And I know um, Scott and his, um, his organisation, we've had some pretty close um, relationships with Fens Fire Emergency New Zealand through our fires that we've had over here. And that's brought together a real opportunity to not only uh, come together in response mode to to deal with these things along with the strategy which is enacted our ability to say hey we want a voice not just in the environment area across the governance and leadership of this region and so people are listening to that and we're bringing the ability um, if we have to we can use our legislative and statutory arrangements as well but we don't want to do that because that would enact that it's not a trusting partnership what we want to do is have conversations at a strategic level with our iwi chairs, our tribal leaders, who are mandated. And then next level at the operations level with our CEOs, our GMs, of which there are eight, to build lasting partnerships to get stuff done. And one of the things that I always, and I'm, if, I always, if, I, if, I, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard, I'd love to build an authentic relationship with mana whenua, with Māori, I'd be a millionaire. The, the issue is, and I go back to the question you asked about if someone was in a public water facility or council public and looked at how do I how do I give effect to the to the uh, the aspirations of mana whenua and indigenous people by sitting at my desk looking at a piece of policy or look at I assure you that's where from those smallest changes that the hearts and minds of those public services can drive forward this change and I really believe that because I've seen it and those people that ask the questions say maybe in the policy development space or in the first responder space or wherever they are working within government, where are the iwi, where are the tribes in this piece of work? It's a simple question, but what it can lead to is a whole lot of cat catalytic change, which gets people to say, have to name and say and, and have a position of support in their hearts and minds. If that's not right, then we're gonna be struggling. So I think that's where those, um, those small changes can make big ones. 
Thank you. So let's now turn to Scott Falconer with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria. And I want to go back to those cultural burns that you were talking about, not done for 170 years. And now you're talking about plans afoot for 120 burns with six different groups. It seems that that relationship has has grown quite quickly between your department and and government um, to, in a in a broader sense and those indigenous groups. How take us through how you how that partnership has been built and and so quickly and and seemingly from what you're saying so successfully as well. Uh, thanks, Dan. Look, so much of what the other guest speakers have said resonates with me. I almost don't know where to start, but I think. Um, I'll start with key principles. I think the genuine partnership that I've heard several people talk about and the genuine relationships, it's got to be genuine. Um, I think that there's the success of the work that we've been doing in, in Lodden Mallee in particular, but now it's breaching out across the state, has been founded on that. It's also been, and we've learned this along the way. So we, we decided to have a philosophy that we'd do the right thing before we could do everything right. Because in bureaucracies, you know, if you wait for the policy setting and everything when there isn't any, you can wait for many, many years. So we we started with that, what we call a walking together partnership approach. We had principles such as that everybody, regardless of which organisation they worked in, had an equal say. Self-determination became the foundation stone of this. And that's a relatively new phrase for a lot of non-Aboriginal people like myself to understand what does that look like. So to give that meaning, um, I, I've, I describe it this way to staff, is because we've had an internal cultural element of changing the way our agency people think, because you know it's no longer having a stakeholder conversation. I think um, Shane mentioned that. It's an equal partner conversation. And as soon as you flip that and you do it meaningfully, it changes everything. Um, the other thing is the power transfer has to happen. So over the course of a couple of years of engaging before we did the first burn, we now use the language that this is traditional owner-led at every stage, planning through to implementation. Now, our role in that, again, we've discovered this language and we use this language, we're enablers. Now, there is unequal power, particularly in resourcing at the moment. We're a $300 million a year business um, and we're working with traditional owners that clearly don't have that level of um, support. So. One of the first things we did that I think led to success once we built those relationships is um, create a position in, in a corporation, a Jajaran corporation of an Aboriginal cultural burn planner. And that was the first one. We're about to put two more on. Um, we're now doing looking at a re-regulation piece to make it just so much easier, but we use plain language to get elders and children back on country to burn. So that's another stage. And, I, and, and the next iteration, I think the longer term iteration for governments um, is, you know, giving sustainable long-term funding to traditional owners so that they can essentially do this independently, but integrated into our system. So our plan burns, you know, aren't happening in isolation to what traditional owners want to do. And we've done all this because traditional owners have told us that's what they want, not that we're saying this is what you should do. And I think that's another key point. I could say a lot more, but I might just hold there. Yeah, the yarning circle. That's where the, that, that's the forum in which people can hear more about this this discussion. I'll come. Um, I'm going to go to you, Shane, and you, Aaron, in a second for some final thoughts. We've got about five minutes to go on this panel chat. But Scott, just before I um, yeah get those closing thoughts, I just want to come to to you and a point you just made there, which was particularly interesting. It sounds like. In, in the organisation, in the department in which you work, a predominantly non-Indigenous organisation, there has been a process of, uh, of cultural change, mindset change, uh, and that's swept through the department over a period of time that's, you know, allowed some, some box thinking it would have been years ago, let's say. How, yeah, how is that place to um, that cultural change process to, to have a relationship with those First Nations groups. Sorry, you break up there a little bit. I think I got the, the gist of it. I'd say two things happen concurrently and it's great, you know, to have a really great project and do what this real significant change is. I think you need 
a lot of good planning and a little bit of luck. And, and I think um, at the same time that we were developing these relationships at a ground level in the field with traditional owners, we had a, a self-determination group set up um, with a self-determination strategy, which is evolving really rapidly. And I'd say that the, the policy and government's intent with treaty and the, and the um, support of self-determination broadly met with what we were doing operationally. And it's almost, you know, it really has been synchronicity. Um, so it's, I think both are really, really important. Um, that's probably the short version. Let's let's uh, go to Shane for some. What's your what's your final one minute wrap up? What's the message you'd like the uh, public servants and public administrators on the uh, on the conference today to take away with them about this issue? I, I just want to just go back what Scott said. I mean, we've found in terms of any successful project needs good leadership, whether it's from a tribal point of view or from an agency point of view, if the if the if the chiefs or the the leaders aren't on board with this, it's not going to filter through. So it becomes BAU. It's embedded through all your organisations, and then if it's if it's a bit tough or it's too tough, then we need to have a sort of self evaluation. Am I the right person for this role? And it, it's it's we've seen it here work really well. And to be fair to say, our services, our police, our military, our civil defence people. Those that are wearing uniforms get it. They really do. They get it because they know the value of doing things better and in partnership because they have to do it throughout their lives. It's the other, the other us, the uh, us that aren't maybe in uniform now, um, but as a previous person involved in military, um, you do, you do miss that, but you can build that too within your own organisations and you can build it from the bottom up. So don't be afraid, the smallest change, um, and, the, and the most important thing, ask that clarifying question, where are the iwi, where are the mana whenua are at in this particular piece of work? Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. And, um, yeah, apologies for the um, me freezing a moment ago. If there's anybody who's joining the conference from MBN Co, get in touch with me during the break and we'll try and sort it out. But, Erin... First, um, before we take that break, let's go to you just for a quick summation. Again, I'll, I'll echo some of the themes that we've seen. Resourcing is crucial. So one of the things that Victoria has done is create paid roles for Aboriginal water officers, both within traditional owner organisations as well as within water corporations and catchment management authorities. And that embeds uh, ongoing paid roles for Aboriginal people to shape those partnerships within those organisations as well as within traditional owner organisations. Um, that resourcing does also start to tackle those questions of power. Um, and that comes into then, I think probably the next thing is to really focus on what is it that traditional owners and First Nations people are saying that they want. That must be the guiding feature. Um, and then that, that creates the opportunity for a partnership. Um, so listen when they tell us what they, what they want. Um, and build the relationships, invest in the relationships over time. The relationships won't happen quickly. Um, mm. Relationships built on trust have to be something that is built over time. And I think when you enter into it, you need to be prepared to stay there um, for a bit of the long haul as well so that Aboriginal people aren't in the business of having to continually build new relationships just to try and get things done.